Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, he's the Tree Farmer of the Year, a man passionate about the forest industry for decades. Plus, want to make your garden look good and taste good? Gary Bachman's got some ideas. Zach Ashmore takes us off the highway to Vicksburg, Mississippi, and friends and colleagues remember Walt Hackney, an encore tribute to one of the country's top cattlemen. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, thanks for joining me today on Farm Week, I'm Mike Russell. Last week you met the Mississippi Logger of the Year, this week Mississippi's tree farmer. To say that he's passionate about forestry is an understatement. He lets a community college use his tree farm as a teaching lab and loves to share the history of the industry. Here's my former co-anchor Leighton Spann with the story. Ovet, Mississippi is southeast of Laurel off of Highway 15. In the early 20th century, it was a thriving sawmill town. Those days are a distant memory, but the tree farm of E.J. Dennis in Ovet holds some of that history. We had seven sawmills in this vicinity, in this close area. Behind me was a huge sawmill, uh, one of the largest in the area, Bentley Emery Sawmill. When they moved in, they built 50 homes, so that'll tell you how many people they worked and stayed here from about 1915 to about 1930. Retired educator E.J. Dennis is passionate about history and passionate about his tree farm. He and his wife Kay live in nearby Ellisville. He inherited this land in Ovette 15 years ago. Mr. Dennis's father bought the property in 1950 with something else in mind besides trees. My daddy was uh, wanted to go in the cattle business. He loved agriculture and wanted to get a large number of cows. So he bought a 160 acres here, about 120 acres near the National Forest. And as our cattle grew, we leased land from 16 section land. But then in the 80s, as he got older, my sister and I were doing different things he began to sell some of the cattle and gradually in the early 80s started planting timber. So we've got timber as old as 32, 33 years old and this on my left is the youngest timber, about five years old. The youngest timber is six acres of longleaf pine seedlings planted in 2013. Other recent management work includes the thinning of 17 acres of loblolly pine on the place. A two-acre public cemetery and the access road to it splits the tree farm property in half. The cemetery was established long before the family purchased the land. E.J. Dennis does 70% of the field work on the tree farm using the advice of forestry consultant Jamie Wally and others. This includes jobs such as erosion control where main farm roads have to cross streams. I had to have something here other than the, that I could always depend on to get the log trucks through. So I was told if I'd put a good culvert in and put a, a foot of dirt on top, a log truck could go through there. So I took a day, got a neighboring farmer with his heavy equipment, and we came in in one day and put this culvert in, put gravel on top of it, and it's, it's gone through one winter and been real successful with the flow of water. And I believe it's going to serve my purpose for years to come, many years to come. You will often see forestry technology students from Jones County Junior College on the Dennis Tree Farm. This group of students is setting up a plot for a timber cruise. E.J. Dennis lets the college use his farm as a training ground for the next generation and to promote forestry as a career. We found out that he had uh, quite a bit of land here that, uh, that he would like for somebody to come out and look at. So it's really been a win-win for us. Uh, we have a great resource to bring our students out to get lab experience and uh, he has uh, someone that can help him do, do different operations, prescribed burning, uh, in, invasive species spraying, uh, a lot of different things that we do for him. 
In 2011, a class of students from Jones put together a written forest management plan for the land. This led to the property becoming a certified tree farm. The students continue to benefit from their access to the farm. As a student, it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to be able to come out here um, and learn and, and study in the field of forestry uh, and, and learn different practices that are put in place here, whether that be you know, whether we're out here cruising or, or prescribed burning or any acts of um, civic culture with land management or anything like that, it's, uh, it's a great place for us to be able to go um, that's a private landowner that we have pretty close to the school. The college students are also introduced to the latest technology while at the Dennis Tree Farm, such as the use of drones in forestry work. FAA-approved drone pilot Zach Brazil of Wiley Forestry Consultants provides some hands-on training on drone operation. His boss, Jamie Wiley, says the drone is changing how they work. We use the drone technology to go in and uh, monitor fire on control burns, going in monitoring southern pine beetles and, you know, tree planting inspections, you know, final harvest inspections, you know, after a logging job's complete. Allowing college students to use this tree farm as a working lab is just one example of how E.J. Dennis likes to share his property and love of tree farming with the community. He even built this pavilion near the farm entrance so he could host large events. He and his wife, Miss Kay, they really are not stingy with their tree farm. They, they bring in the whole community. And that's what's so special about the Dennises is that they share their property and their tree farm and the love for, of the land with the community. This is the base camp and that's exactly what they call it and it's actually the initials for their grandkids is what it turns out to be but it makes it makes a good base camp name and this is the the home spot it, it sure is so this is where they have the field days that people speak and you can be a little bit cooler than being out in the sun it's nice shade and it's got a little kitchen area. And Miss Kay is, always puts her little touches on everything and makes it more special. In May 2018, E.J. and Kay Dennis hosted a Jones County Forestry Association field day and educational program on the farm and in this pavilion. Other programs are presented throughout a typical year to various community groups. E.J. Dennis is an active member of the Mississippi Forestry Association. He is also active in the local county forestry association and has served as vice president and president multiple years. He's a vital part of the you know, Jones County Forestry Association. He's on the board there. You, know, you don't make a meet without Mr. E.J. being there. And he's you know, always there to help. And he, you know, very informative guy. The primary objectives of this tree farm are wildlife management, recreation, and timber production. He's also involving the next generation of his family in the tree farm. I have seven grandchildren now. We have two or three ponds on this place, plenty of places they can fish. They're the age now that they're able to work and do some things. They're actually the fourth generation that's worked on this property. And I'm proud to say it's the fourth generation that's been on this place. Thank you, Layton. Are you one of those cooks who likes using fresh herbs in your culinary masterpieces? Today in Southern Gardening, Gary Bachman shows us how we can double up and make our fresh herb gardens both good tasting and good looking. This is a great time to be growing herbs in containers. Let me share a few ideas for thriller, filler, and spiller combination herb containers. For combo number one, curry plant is the thriller with its woolly, silver gray, needle-like, aromatic foliage that are great with egg dishes. The filler is the mounding spicy globe basil, having a pleasant spicy scent and flavor, and perfect for tomato recipes. And the spiller is creeping rosemary with scented bluish green needle-like foliage sprawling over the container edge. Combo number two has a fruity theme and the thriller is lemongrass and it does thrill in Thai dishes with its lemony hints of ginger flavor. Lemon basil is the filler. 
the lemon scented foliage is a great accent for fish or poultry dishes. The spiller is pineapple mint with a delicate pineapple scent and foliage having creamy variegation and edges. For combo number three, upright rosemary is a thrilling plant with wonderfully aromatic foliage that's fantastic in stews and baked dishes. Purple sage is the filler with textured foliage that emerges a handsome reddish purple and is great in sausage or stuffing recipes. The spiller is English thyme. The aromatic gray-green leaves are wonderful with poultry dishes and an essential part of herb bundles called bouquet garni. Making combo herb containers is an attractive way to open up a whole new world in the garden and the kitchen. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. In April, we lost longtime market analyst Walt Hackney, one of the top cattlemen in America. He was known throughout the industry and had a reputation for being tough but knowledgeable and fair. Again, our thoughts go out to his wife of nearly 60 years. Here's a piece done back in 2015 during a cattle buying trip in the Rockies. David Miller reports. In the rough and tumble world of cattle production, it takes a certain type of personality to handle the monetary risks of a volatile market and the often bigger than life personalities who buy those animals. From ranchers in the high plains to employees beyond the packing house door, few are able to fill those boots but Walt Hackney makes the grade. Hackney has spent countless miles on the open road over the past six decades, traveling from auction barn to weighing shed, buying millions of cattle from New York to California. He remains one of the few who will purchase feeders for placement, negotiate futures contracts, and sell cattle directly to packers. I'd like to think that there are others that are deeply interested in protecting your client base is what I am. And, and I believe that there are out there doing it. It helps stabilize your market. The day Hackney graduated from Oklahoma State University, he left for Ottumwa, Iowa, and his new job as a cattle buyer with the John Morrell Company. The trunk of his car was filled with a few pots and pans, some old clothes, and a well-worn saddle. I had visions of standing on the lower boards of a corral, looking out over a herd of finished cattle, ready for a packer to buy them. Well, it just goes to show you how wrong you can be. That first morning, I, I signed in at the plant, and uh, they gave me a pair of rubber boots and uh, a fire hose and they, um, they said, your first job will be to go out and wash the manure out of the pens, and you keep washing them until you get ready to go home tonight. After several months of working his way through every aspect of the production line, Hackney was put on the road buying cattle. Over the next few decades, he started a family, became a head cattle buyer for the XL Packing Company, formerly owned by meat industry giant Cargill, and in 1992, he opened Hackney Ag Associates, a full-service cattle buying and forward contracting operation. High in the Rocky Mountains, ranchers near the town of Colburn, Colorado, were having trouble making a profit on their cattle. The Colburn ranching community pushed Mike Ralston to the front of the pack to ask Hackney, who was buying cattle for national farmer feeders at the time, to purchase cattle from a pool of 25 producers. Actually, I wasn't real sure when I first met him. Uh, we weren't, uh, none of us real impressed with him, you know. You, you had to sort of warm up to him, but, and maybe he's mellowed out a little bit too, I, I don't know. But as a person, he's about as honest and straightforward. Uh, he gets along with everybody, which is important. What you see is what you get. Today, cattlemen in the Colburn pool continue to feel like they're being treated fairly by the veteran buyer. Longtime friend Ed Warner clears the cattle through his Albia, Iowa based Central States Cattle Company. Uh, we've become to know Walt as a very honorable, very honest guy and very big hearted, 
and he is fair with everybody that he deals with. If there's any mistakes or any problems, Walt's probably going to be the one to take the bump. Farther down the buying chain are producers like Bob Frist of Hubbard, Iowa. On a foggy fall morning, he's taking delivery of 480 head of cattle from the Rangeford, Montana pool. A few years ago, Frist sought out Hackney because he wanted the best cattle available. It don't cost you any more to feed the good ones than it does the bad ones. Ever since Walt and I have gotten together, he's always did the best he could ever do for me. Not only for the, the producer out there, he gets the money for the producer, but he also makes us feel like we're getting a good buy on the cattle on this end. When the cattle are ready in the high country, Hackney will be back in the saddle putting more miles on his car. His rounds will ultimately take him to Colburn, where he can look over the pool and sign a few checks. Our industry is one of a few that you actually grow about as much in the hard times as you do in the good times. Hard times, you're forced to really wear out a number two lead pencil making it work. And so the hard times and the good times thrown together, I wouldn't want to change a thing. Well, time for a little break, but stay close. Coming up in our final Farm Week feature, we're getting off the highway again with Zach Ashmore. This time he's headed to Vicksburg for a look-see at the first place in the world where Coca-Cola was ever bottled. It's a surprising story about the real thing. Also in Vicksburg, Zach tours Walnut Hills and Antebellum Howe's home to authentic plantation cuisine. Come ride with us off the highway, coming up on Farm Week. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life, giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea. Extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Always wear a regulation helmet, gloves, and goggles when operating a four-wheeler. Long sleeves, pants, and over-the-ankle boots are also smart protection. Mississippi law requires approved ATV safety training for all operators who don't have a driver's license. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. If you love traveling rural settings, this next story is for you, an encore presentation of a segment we premiered in 2018 here on Farm Week. In this episode, we head to Vicksburg, Mississippi for a soda pop and trip to a pre-Civil War home that's now a haunted restaurant. Here's Zach Ashmore with Off the Highway. Off the Highway, a show where we explore hidden gems all across the state of Mississippi that you ought to know about. I'm your host, Zach Ashmore, and today we're headed to the heart of Vicksburg, Mississippi to check out the Biedenharn Coca-Cola Museum and the Walnut Hills Restaurant. But first, we're going to meet up with Extension Agent Sandy Havard, and she's going to show us on our way.
Miss Sandy Havard, you are the extension agent for Warren County. Tell me, what do you like so much about Warren County and the people of Vicksburg in particular? Well, I really love the people here. Um, they are really great to work with. Um, we have a rich history and culture in Vicksburg, and we have some of the best attractions in the state. And that includes what we're, where we're at now, the Biedenhorn Coca-Cola Museum. That's exactly right. The Biedenhorn Coca-Cola Museum is one of the many attractions here. Miss Nancy Bell runs the museum, and we're going to go meet her right now. <laughs> Nancy Bell, we are here at the Biedenhorn Coca-Cola Museum here in Vicksburg, Mississippi. What's the history of this place? This is where Coca-Cola was first bottled anywhere in the world in 1894. So this building was built by the Biedenhorns in 1890. Before they started bottling it, they had it as a syrup. It was made in Atlanta, Georgia, 1886 by a pharmacist, but it was only sold at soda fountains. Mr. Biedenhorn, being one of those, would have it in his soda fountain, along with, a lot of times, hundreds of flavors. So people come in, they get a Coca-Cola, but they couldn't take it with them. You even left the glass. They liked it a lot better than they liked um, his flavor, and so they asked, a number of people asked, you know, can't we get Coca-Cola to take with us? Why is it we can only get it here as a glass and have to leave it? So he bottled a case of it. He sent it to Atlanta to ask for permission. And they said, yeah, you can do it if you want to. It won't amount to anything, but if you want to do it, go ahead. <laughs> Little did they know, Yes, right? that's right. Because, of course, <laughs> what they saw were the soda fountains. And soda fountains were the thing of the day. That's where you went. To me, the, most, the, the coolest thing is the reproduction of the bottling works. And then we show you how... You had to fill the bottle, well, you had to wash the bottle first and then you had to fill the bottle. And that filling bottles was a dangerous occupation because if they blew up, you didn't want to get hurt. Yeah, like how thick is that glass? It's like what, like two, oh, three millimeters? Oh, it's even more than that and in and, and parts of that bottle. It's very, very thick and the top of it has a very thick blob top. So obviously if you got the name blob top, you know it was a really thick top. <laughs> um, but the blob top and then it was sealed with a rubber stopper with a wire that went into it and pushed it down in there. Tradition holds that when you pulled that stopper out, it made a really loud popping noise and that's where we get soda pop from. So you have so many really cool pieces here. Do you have any ones that are your personal favorite? My favorite things are the, the little miniature um, uh, dispensers, you know, as, as in, you know, Coke bottle dispensers, because if you were a salesperson going to, you know, someone to say, okay, well, this is a great um, bottle dispenser, you know, you couldn't take it with you. You couldn't take the big thing. So they made little tiny ones. And so we've got some of those. And then, of course, all the Santa Claus to me is, is fascinating as well. And um, it's fun. And it all started right here in Vicksburg, Mississippi, it's at least the bottling part. Well, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Well, I, heard the scene. I heard that you know more about this place than anybody else who works here. Why is that? Because I've been here the longest. <laughs> how, how long have you been working here? I've been working here 38 years. A long time. What have you seen? What, what can you tell me about this place? Oh my God. What have I seen? Or what haven't I seen? How about a little bit of both? <laughs> <laughs> I have seen them come and go. The first owner was Kim Ferris. She owned it and she sold to Joyce about 20 some years ago. Joyce asked me would I stay on with her. So. There you are. Here I am. I was told that your uh, fried chicken has won awards. It has. And you know what? People think we do a big deal to that fried chicken, but the fried chicken is only washed, seasoned with red pepper and salt and put in the flour and drop it in the deep fat fry. So I'm guessing the, uh, the actual secret to it is it's fresh. Right. So what can you tell me about the Walnut Hills restaurant itself? Like, how long has this restaurant been here? This restaurant been here 38 years. So what was this place before it was, before it was a restaurant? It was a house. People lived, a lady lived here. She loved the glazed carrots we fixed, and she would call and order glazed carrots. But I'm gonna tell you a little secret. When we first started in this restaurant here, I came to work one morning, I got out right down there, and I was gonna walk up the hill. So I saw this lady in this blue evening dress standing in this one right here. I, come, I came back down to look to see what she's still there. 
where she was, but by the time I got inside, she had gone. Oh, you saw a ghost. But she's a friendly ghost. She was so pretty. She was a pretty lady. She was beautiful. What would you say to somebody who's interested in checking out this place? Well, I tell them to come on. This is one of the places you should visit before you leave this world. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all the thing I can tell you. It's one of the places you should visit. You should come to Walnut Hills, and you won't be unhappy. You will be happy when you leave. Cheers to that. All right, then. Okay. Vicksburg is a truly historical town, and you learn something new every time you go there. I highly recommend that you check it out. Well, that's it for this week. But if you know of any places that are off the highway, send me a line. Who knows? Maybe I'll be off the highway next time in your hometown. Until then, take care. Zach's right, there really is a lot of history in Vicksburg, and that food at Walnut Hills looks pretty tasty, too. Next week, an inspiring story, especially as we approach summer when Americans grill so much food, yet so many have trouble just putting food on the table. It's called City Harvest, a big city group that stands in the breach between the kitchen and the trash can. A million pounds of food every week recovered so that a million and a half New Yorkers don't have to go without. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.